We have, at long last, come to the final issue of Nintendo Power's eighth year for May of 1996. The last year of the Nintendo Power before the start of the launch of the N64, and we have the results of the Nestor Awards. I know they're not officially called the Nestor Awards anymore, they're now called the Nintendo Power Awards, but as far as I'm concerned, they are the Nestors. Period. End of story. You don't like it? You can bite my bow tie. After I get a bow tie. But, point stands. Our cover game for this issue is Ken Griffey Jr.'s Winning Run, a game which I previously reviewed back in episode 107, so I will be skipping that game this issue. In the letters column, we get a letter complaining about people complaining about the objectification of women in video games, which shows that these attitudes of extreme entitlement among self-identified male gamers is not a new concept. It didn't come about in the late 90s or, or even late 2000s, um, or when with Goober Gob and all of that. It's been around since at least the mid-90s, possibly even earlier. We also get a letter bringing out the layout problems with poor type-based color choices contrasted with screenshots in the background. So it's good to know that somebody is bringing up that on that nonsense and calling them out for it. In the power charts, we have some titles returning to the rankings. Civilization and Uniracers have returned for the Super Nintendo, and Dr. Mario and Wario Land for the Game Boy. We also have a pair of newcomers. Super Mario RPG has entered the charts on the Super NES, and Defender and Joust for the Game Boy. Our game ranking is for top RPGs, and to no one's real surprise, Square is ruling the roost. Next up is our cover game, Ken Griffey Jr.'s Winning Run, which, as I have already mentioned, I've already reviewed. The article gives some gameplay notes, which arguably makes for some good strategy for baseball and baseball video games in general, so still worth kind of perusing for that regard if you want to get better at playing baseball video games. Next up is a preview for another in-development game for the Nintendo 64, Mission Impossible, a stealth action game for the system based on the movie. However, consequently, because the movie comes out in May 1996, which means when this issue is hitting newsstands, the article is going to be fairly light on the plot side of things, because we don't know the, that, oh, our actual protagonist is Ethan Hunt, uh, Jim Phelps is a bad guy, and we don't know why um, Ethan Hunt is doing that descending from the rafters thing in that one room, in that one strange white room that we don't have a context for in the trailers yet. So, in any case, also consequently, the game, the article is in more light of details than normal, like no much plot information. And also, not much, I mean, there's some game mechanic information in terms of it being kind of stealthy, stealth-focused in third person, but not much more than that. So, it's pretty, it gives you lots more screenshots of what the N64 is capable of, but at the moment, that's kind of it. Our first game we'll actually be reviewing this issue is Mohawk and Headphone Jack, which has a gimmick where the game's levels rotate as you traverse them. The article gives a boatload of level maps, all of which are oriented normally, so presumably while you're reading the issue, you'll need to spin the uh, magazine around as you go. Which is useful, particularly since while well, there's an... Well, we'll get into that with the actual game. Mohawk and Headphone Jack is a game that has levels a little too big and expansive for their own good. I appreciate the concept. It basically has them doing their own spin on Sonic the Hedgehog that takes full advantage of the Mode 7 capabilities of the Super Nintendo to provide last massive levels that give a really another twist on some of the level elements of the Sonic games. Okay, I'll stop. The problem is the level designs can and do get a little too big to wrap your head around. All right, I, I mean it this time. Now, while the game lets you zoom out to view the whole level using the select button, it still became a little tough to find the best way to path through the game's levels. You, the charts, or the, the mapping, basically kind of stays with the right-side-up orientation, as opposed to the maps in Nintendo Power, which they're, they're in the magazine, you can turn it wherever you need to, to help you uh, kind of figure out where you need to go, that sort of thing. Um, so, on more than a few occasions, even with the full map of the level at my disposal, I found myself basically stuck right, 
route I needed to take to complete the game. It's really enough to make you flip your lid. Any case, next up is Lobo, a fighting game based on the DC Comics character who was a Wolverine pastiche and which never actually came out. That said, going from the article, it was probably pretty far along before it got the axe. We got move lists for most of the characters here, which, I mean, when you're designing fighting games characters, certainly you need to think about your moves fairly early on because um, you're doing your animations and that sort of thing. But still, with that a little more far along than you'd expect for the game to get cancelled. We have the results of the Nestor Awards. The big winners are... First off, Donkey Kong Country 2 taking the awards for Best Sound, Best Graphics, Best Challenge, and with Squatter the Spider taking Best Sidekick, and Captain K. Rule taking the Best Villain. Chrono Trigger took Best Story, Best Epic Game, Best Ending, and Best SNES Game with the Epoch also winning Best Transportation, and the Juggler winning Worst Baddie, which is the category for generic villains. Yoshi's Island won Best Play Control and Most Innovative Game, with Yoshi themselves winning Best Hero, and also winning most of the game winning Most Annoying Feature for Baby Mario's Crying. While I wouldn't have picked it compared to some of the other competition, I certainly can't fault them for that. Doom took the Owie Award for Best Mature Rated Game and Coolest Weapon for the Chainsaw. Groovy. Killer Instinct took home Best Multiplayer Game and Best Tournament Fighter. And the rest of the ones were just kind of one-offs. Um, the Donkey Kong Country uh, Game Boy Game one there, and we're not going to talk about the Virtual Boy. In classified information, we get a code for Nosferatu to fill up your strength meter at any time for unlimited times, which is good, because if you pick up a red crystal with a full strength meter, you get more health back, which helps you get further into the game. We have some more information on the Blood of the Chozo collaborative fanfic project on AOL. I have finally managed to find an archive of it somewhere. I should probably give it a read at some point. Maybe I'll get a bonus episode out of that. That would be an interesting discussion. Maybe. Now... Next up, we have a co some codes for College Slam, because it's built on the same engine in it as NBA Jam, so there's a bunch of cheats in common. In Epic Center News, we have our first dimension of Pokemon, which has already come out in Japan, and here we just have it described as Pocket Monsters, but the game has yet to receive a US release date. Additionally, Nintendo is staffing up for a N64 sequel to Super Mario RPG, which I suspect may be the first Paper Mario game. And speaking of Super Mario RPG, we have a continuation of the game's strategy guide this issue, going through the fight with Punchinello. Our next featured game of the issue is the second Lufia game, which is a prequel to the first one. The article includes some discussion of the title's more involved puzzle mo mechanics, along with the monster companion system, which is crabbed from some of the Dragon Quest games. So... Luvia 2 is a game that I did a write-up for a while back for Hardcore Gaming 101, so I am pretty familiar with the game as like for I basically beat most of beat this and beat most of Luvia 1 back in the day. Um, I will have a link to the write-up in the show notes if you want something longer and more involved about this game. The more succinct version of my thoughts on this title is that this game is a very solid refinement on the first Luvia game. Lufia, the Fortress of Doom, felt very much on the level of Final Fantasy IV. There were some very solid mechanical ideas in that game, paired with a very well-done story, but it was also a game that needed some very serious spit and polish. There are heavily involved, heavy backtracking fetch quests that take you all across the map, making it very grindy at points. Um, the first game, particularly as the later you get, the more tedious some of the elements of the game become. Here, on the other hand, Rise of the Naturals, I would compare more to Final Fantasy VI. Or three for the US release. The mechanics are greatly improved, and it's paired with better dungeon design, and the, along with the introduction of some new mechanics in terms of companion monsters. A concept very clearly, and again, as before, very uh, tweaked from the monster party members you can get in the Super Nintendo Dragon Quest games with much more of a unique spin on it. Um, kind of also kind of taking a bit from like the saga games with monster evolutions and that sort of thing. 
it's clear that the developers were aware that the strength of the first game, beyond just the story, was the puzzle dungeon element. And Lufia 2 leans so much more into that, with, which makes the title end up feeling much more like a spiritual predecessor to the Wild Arms and Golden Sun games, in spite of those games sharing absolutely no staff with the Lufia series. The puzzles are incredibly well designed, and I can definitely see how these these games inspired other developers to take Zelda-style puzzle dungeons and put them into turn-based RPG, like this one, and as you would see later again, with Wild Arms on the PlayStation and Golden Sun on the Game Boy Advance. We're quickly returning to the original uh, Breath of Fire with some expanded strategy information, presumably fueled by increased call volume to the game counselors. Next up is an article on The Loud House. This is not related to the animated television series. Instead, this appears to be an internet radio show put on by Nintendo of America through their AOL page, with interviews of each of the three DJs. It's interesting seeing this portrait of the early days of the internet, and in particular, internet multimedia in this way. Nowadays, this show would be a podcast, and you can listen to it at any time. And certainly, the episodes of the show would be basically archived for eternity through, if not official channels on podcast servers and that sort of thing, but probably also uploaded to archive.org. Instead, However, at this point, the MP3 format, it kind of exists, but hasn't been popularized yet. Napster is three years away. Podcasts are four years away. And for that matter, um, Shoutcast and Live 365 also aren't around yet either. So what we have here is the internet live radio show that's basically being served by AOL that you can only listen, uh, that you're going to have to listen to over dial-up or if you're in college, your dorm's T1 or DSL line. Considering all of this predates the Shoutcast protocol and Live 365, this actually puts Nintendo somewhat ahead of the curve, again, ahead of Shout, ahead of all of the normal streaming radio formats. That's really impressive. I kind of wish there were archives of this somewhere, because again, I'd like to listen to some archives of old episodes of this and see what it's like. Even if it's cringe-worthy 90s garbage, that would still be some cringe-worthy 90s garbage I'd at least get a kick out of listening to once or twice, just to kind of see what it was like. Moving on to our last game of the issue, and our only Game Boy game, we have 1996 Summer Olympic Games, a track and field game for the Game Boy. I'm also noticing there doesn't appear to be any information for it on a Super Nintendo version, at least at this time. Well, 96 Olympic Summer Games is exactly what you expect it to be, as I said earlier, it's a track and field game. And the sense of world-class track and field, and other similar titles for the NES back in the day. For what it's worth, it's a lot more forgiving in a lot of respects than other Olympic track and field titles. The controls are nice and simple, you do not have to win or even medal in each event in order to progress, which is nice. And consequently, the difficulty curve is enough that because I'm not able to win every event, but I was able to win most of them, I was still able to gold medal enough to win the campaign mode. In Counselor's Corner, we get some information on how to get Chrono back in Chrono Trigger, without explicitly stating why you need to get him back. Which is nicely and diplomatically done. After Link's Awakening got a Wii release... Mario All-Stars is getting one next, and this article reiterates some of the early advice for all four games in the collection from earlier issues of Nintendo Power. No also rans in the Now Playing column this issue. And in Pack Watch, the N64 launch lineup is coming together, and we have a bunch of screenshots for other games for the system, specifically Mario 64, Pilot Wings, and Turok Dinosaur Hunter. Also a couple titles of note for the Game Boy, with a sequel to Sword of Hope, and Dragonheart, based on the motion picture. My pick of the week, if you can find a copy at an affordable price, is Lufia 2. That said, there are a ton of bootlegs out there, so be careful where you shop, um, and your eBay sellers, and that sort of thing. It is a really good game. It is undoubtedly one of the best JRPGs on the Nintendo, on the uh, Super Nintendo. Um, arguably, it's like 
this version uh, is better, one of the best JRPGs on a Nintendo platform. Um, but that's a bit of, okay, maybe that's, maybe that's a bit of a stretch, but it's a really solid game, and I don't think it gets the level of love that it deserves. So I recommend, in any case, I definitely recommend picking it up. It did get a remake for the th Nintendo DS, uh, which is not, not so good, I will say. It's okay, but it doesn't have... It's much more of an action RPG, and I think that, consequently, the game is hurt by it. Now, next month, it is time, once again, to delve into the also-rans for Nintendo Power, in this case, for its eighth year, before, one, before we finally get... To the Nintendo 64. So let's so, but in the meantime, let's go see if we can find some gems that maybe were overlooked when it came to feature coverage. We'll see you then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, Tossing me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.